Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and sports zodians. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I am Mike Aglialoro. I am your host. For this is Sports Zone. Coming to you live like we do each and every week here via the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network, September 11th, folks. And we got a great show for you tonight. We're going to be joined by Dave Hastings in a matter of moments here. No Eric Trussler tonight, unfortunately, but we still got a great show for you tonight. We've got a lot to get to. We are looking back at the first weekend of the NFL season. Big weekend. A lot of stuff that happened. Tampa Bay shocked everybody, led by Ryan Fitzpatrick. They were calling him Ryan Fitz Magic, and I don't know if I would go quite that far, but it definitely was impressive to see what he was able to do against the New Orleans Saints. The Cleveland Browns technically did not lose on Sunday for the first time in over 17 weeks, but... We'll get into that in a little while. I I gotta be honest. If I'm a Cleveland Brown fan, I'm looking at that game on Sunday and I'm realizing this team ain't ready to win yet. And it's a shame because they've done they've put together so much talent on that team. You look at what Denzel Ward did on that game, and I was one of the people who thought the Browns taking Denzel Ward with the fourth overall pick was a huge mistake. Denzel Ward came to play on Sunday against Pittsburgh Steelers with two interceptions. Miles Garrett and Jabril Peppers having big games on the defense as well. A lot of really good pieces there. Six turnovers forced on the day. Uh, They forced them to the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, of course, and they still couldn't win that game. And that that just makes you wonder what they're going to be like for the rest of the season. Because they had that win. They had that win. They showed a stat, and I know I'm going to get it wrong. There's something like over the last five years or over the last ten years, teams who uh, force five or more turnovers or 130-something and two and then you look at the Browns, who are 2-2 two and two over that period with the one tie. So that just, that just makes you wonder right there. Because according to that stat, five or more turnovers, that's a surefire win. Not if you're the Cleveland Browns, though. So that just, again, it just makes you wonder – what this season really holds. If that's the best they can play on defense and they still can't get a a victory, what does that say about their chances for the rest of the season? So we have that, and we will be joined, like I said, by Dave Hastings in a few moments here. Before we are joined by him, we're going to do what we try to do every week here on the Sports Show, and we're going to look at the live scoreboard to baseball games that are happening right now. The Miami Marlins are up 2-1 to one over the New York Mets in the bottom of the seventh inning. And I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the Mets have been terrible this season. We know this. Um, you can't lose this game today. You can't lose this game today. It is September 11th. Whenever sports fans – Whenever you see the montages of sports moments stemming from 9-11, you always see the, the, the Mike Piazza home run against the Atlanta Braves in the first baseball game that was played after 9-11. The Mets have basically become synonymous with the recovery of this country and this state after that horrible tragedy. And it would be an absolute embarrassment in a season of embarrassing moments if you lose this game today on September 11th. I am am sorry, folks. You can't. You just can't do it, especially when you had Jacob DeGrom pitching tonight. 
Anyway, Houston is up six to four over the Detroit Tigers in the bottom of the sixth inning. Going into the top of the eighth inning, the Cincinnati Reds are up three to one over the LA Dodgers. The Oakland almost said the Oakland Raiders. The Oakland A's are up three to one over the Baltimore Orioles in the top of the seventh inning. Top of the sixth inning, Philadelphia is up five to three. I think that's five to three over the Washington Nationals. Bottom of the sixth inning, Toronto Blue Jays are up two to nothing over the Boston Red Sox. Bottom seventh inning, Cleveland Indians are up two to nothing over the Tampa Bay Rays. Bottom third, the New York Yankees are up one to nothing over the Minnesota Twins. Bottom third, the Chicago Cubs are up two to nothing over the Milwaukee Brewers. Top third, the St. Louis Cardinals are up two to nothing over the Pittsburgh Pirates. Bottom third. Chicago White Sox up one to nothing over the Kansas City Royals. Just underway in the bottom of the first inning, the Arizona Diamondbacks are now up two to one over the Colorado Rockies. And earlier today in game one of their doubleheader, the Washington Nationals did defeat the Philadelphia Phillies by a score of three to one. And then the 10 o'clock games, you have the Texas Rangers taking on the Los Angeles Angels. And at 10 10, the San Diego Padres taking on the Seattle Mariners and a 10-15, the Atlanta Braves going to San Francisco to take on the Giants. So that is your live scoreboard of the games that are happening now. So let's look back on the first weekend of the NFL season. While we wait for Dave to come here, I want to run through the scores of this past weekend real quick. The games kicked off last Thursday. Philadelphia beat the Atlanta Falcons by a score of 18-12 to 12 in a brutal game. Uh, one of the worst played Thursday night games in a while, and that is really saying something. Uh, but the defending champion, Philadelphia Eagles, I hate saying that, did pull out the victory. Then we got the tie ball game, Pittsburgh Steelers tie with the Cleveland Browns 21-21. to 21. Cincinnati pulls out the victory over the Indianapolis Colts and Andrew Luck's return, 34 to 23, in a game that lasted seven hours, folks. The Miami Dolphins did beat the Tennessee Titans by a score of 27 to 20. In the battle of the hundred million dollar quarterbacks, Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings beat the San Francisco 49ers by a score of 24 to 16. Hmm. Interesting there. The New England Patriots beat the Houston Texans by a score of 27 to 20. Like we said before, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers dominated the New Orleans Saints for the majority of the game by a score of 48 to 40. The Saints made it close in the fourth quarter, but they were down by about 18 at one point in this game. So, that score, that final score is just a tad bit misleading there. And uh, we didn't even get to this one yet. The Jacksonville Jaguars beat the New York Giants by a score of 20 to 15. I'm going to say this again when Dave comes on. I kind of wish Eric was on here this week because, you know, over the last couple weeks, we've heard him talk about Eric Flowers and how he has no confidence in the Giants while Eric Flowers is still on the offensive line. Well, Eric Flowers did everything he could to prove why Eric felt that way in this game against the Jaguars, starting the game off with two penalties that negated long passes to both Odell Beckham and the tight end Evan Ingram. Then again, having some – getting beat very badly by some plays late in the game. You know, the, the Giants, they lost this game as a team. But, uh, yeah, Flowers showed that he is not a legitimate NFL st starter with this game. And then you had the most lopsided um, game from this weekend. <sighs> I don't think anybody really thought the Buffalo Bills were a good football team, but God damn, that's all you can say about this one. Baltimore destroys the Buffalo Bills by a score of 47-3. Nathan Peterman was taken out in the first half. Josh Allen came in. 
I think we all thought that was a matter of time. The Bills keep trying to push this Nathan Peterman as a legitimate NFL starting quarterback, and he's just not one. It's not, it's not even that, you know, you can think of him as a halfway decent player. He's a terrible football player. And you, you would hope for the Bills' sake that that's going to be it for him in terms of his starting career. Josh Allen didn't really do much better, but by the t- time he came in, that game was over. So you have that. Kansas City beat the Los Angeles uh, Chargers by a score of 38-28. One more can you say about Tyree Kill? Anybody who doesn't believe that guy is legitimate is simply not paying attention, folks. Uh, he starts off the game with a, a long kick return for a touchdown, follows it up with a receiving touchdown. And the Chiefs never really looked back in this game. Patrick Mahomes, you know, it's funny because I think all three of us really thought that um, the the Chiefs were going to wind up taking some sort of a step back this year. Not if Mahomes keeps making those throws like he was making them on Sunday. I could tell you that one. So you have that. And then to keep going down the slate here, Denver beats the Seattle Seahawks by a score of 27-24. to 24. Keenum looked pretty good in his first game uh, with the new contract. Washington, led by Alex Smith and Adrian Peterson, and Chris Thompson beat Sam Bradford and the Arizona Cardinals by a score of 24-6. to 6. And then you got the Dallas Cowboy game. And Carolina and Cam Newton did, in fact, beat the Dallas Cowboys by a score of 16-8. And I'll say this. Cam Newton ran all over the Cowboys' defense. Sean Lee and Demarcus Lawrence actually did make some pretty good plays. Lawrence, i tell you this, he looks like he could be more than a one-year wonder. I will say that. But now we have a problem that we really haven't seen coming from Dallas the last few years because, you know, we haven't really talked about Travis Fredericks being sidelined indefinitely with the uh, immunodeficiency virus that he has. And I don't remember the exact name of the specific virus, but it is one that attacks his immune system. And, um, he is going to be out indefinitely. You have Zach Martin, who was banged up in this game. And all of a sudden, the much vaunted Cowboys offensive line is really hurting here, folks. And it's really um, going to throw a wrinkle in what the team thought they were going to be able to do, do this season. Because without that offensive line, your whole game plan goes out the window. I think we all knew without Des Bryant and without Jason Witten, this team was going to have a hard time in the passing game. Now, you don't even really have a run game to speak of because you don't got the blockers to open up the holes for Ezekiel Elliott. Dak Prescott got sacked six times in this game. When is the last time you can remember the Cowboys offensive line giving up six sacks in the game? So, uh, yeah, it's really not a good start to the season for the Cowboys there. And then Sunday night, Aaron Rodgers goes out in the first half with a leg injury. I tell you this, that Chicago offense, man, that first half, if you saw them, Trubisky looked really good. Tariq Cohen and Jordan Howard, the two-man rushing attack for the Bears, looked very good. All the weapons were really coming to play. It really looked like the Bears were going to take this game. And then Aaron Rodgers came back in the second half and just completely dominated the, the whole thing. So with that, we are going to welcome... Dave Hastings to the show tonight. Dave, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, my friend. I'm doing good. How about yourself? 
Not too bad, not too bad. So before you came on, I was kind of running through the recap of all of Sunday's action, and I didn't even get to the Monday night games, which, of course, we know the New York Jets destroyed the Detroit Lions by a score of 48-17, and then the L.A. Rams dominated the Oakland Raiders by a score of 33-13. I think we all kind of saw that one coming. But let's get let's get some thoughts from you. What were your big impress? What were the what were the things that made the biggest difference through week one? Well, I mean, you know, we can go all the way back to Thursday and how crazy it was to end up having the Atlanta Philly game literally end up in the same type of setting as their playoff game did last year, with you know. Atlanta being inside the 10-yard line with a chance to score and win the game and, you know, Philly coming up with a stop. Um, you know, I kind of look at looked at Atlanta this year as a team that I expected to, you know, take a step forward with the second year under the new offensive coordinator and, you know, really kind of expected more out of them. And I think they went 0 for 4 in the red zone. Um, uh, first drive, they don't even put up points. Philly, you know, until they get Wentz back, I'm not going to really pass much judgment on them just because Nick Foles, I mean, look, he he got hot and went on a run in the playoffs, but I think we all still know Nick Foles is really just a backup quarterback in this league. Mm. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, knock Philly from what I saw from them, but props to Darren Sproles and coming back and looking like Darren Sproles. I mean, 14 years in the league, the guy's like the ageless freaking wonder. Um, Absolutely. You know, so, I mean, you can kind of start with that game and, you know, just the opening kickoff, having it be delayed, which obviously sucked for all NFL fans who are just excited to watch a football game again that mattered. Um, you know, but from Sunday, I mean, the, the biggest things that kind of stuck out to me is, just the difference in what Green Bay is with and without Aaron Rodgers. Um, the impact that Khalil Mack literally has and the impact player that he is. Um, you know, from the day games, Jacksonville defense didn't look as unbreakable as they did last year in their first game because that Giants offense, you know, were able to move the ball but kind of would stall around midfield. You know, they give up a long touchdown run to Saquon Barkley, the rookie, who, you know, kind of on that one play alone showed why the Giants took him at the number two. Um, you know, and I think that's something worth kind of diving into is, you know, I still don't think you have a clear-cut answer on whether the Giants made the right choice by going Barkley or if they should have taken Darnold after what you saw out of him on Monday night. Um, but Jacksonville definitely still has room to improve. Uh, the Giants, that offensive line, Eric Flowers shouldn't have an NFL job. I don't really think there's any other way to say it. He just should not have an NFL job. There's definitely got to be guys out there that are better than he is. It's, um, it's, it's funny because I was saying before you came on, you know, over, over the last couple of weeks, our Eric, Eric Tressler, I mean, he, he couldn't bash Flowers enough. And I kind of went into the Sunday's game thinking, I know he's been bad, but he can't be that bad. No, he's that bad. He's terrible. I think you and me, you t you tie us together like the three man potato sack race. I think we could do a better job than he is. He could. Uh, I don't know if I'll go that far. <laughs> I, I, dude, I would I would give it a, sh a shot. I'd give it a shot. I, I will definitely say it's not that far fetched. I just don't know if I'd go that far personally. All right, well, I, t I tell you what, rather than the two of us, one of us will, will flip a coin and we'll go with Eric Tressler. I think, I think we could do it. I, I, think, I think if you do that, you might have a, you might have a point. Uh, Eric, <laughs> Eric's got a little more, uh, little more uh, strength to him, and we'll phrase it that way. But I mean, We both know he'd be doing all the work. He'd be doing uh, all the work. We'd just be there. He'd at, he'd at least be taking the brunt of the beating. There's no question about Absolutely. that. Uh, but, yeah, Flat, Flowers should not be in the league. But Saquon Barkley definitely showed you, you know, busting. I don't think Jacksonville gave up a run that long all of last season. Mm -hmm. For him to be able to bust out a run like that, especially in a moment where Jacksonville knew 
if they got a stop, that game was over, no questions, ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm-hmm. And that touchdown actually gave the Giants a fighting chance to come back and win that game. So, you know, I think that's one of those things that, you know, you got to kind of give them credit. Um, you know, Dallas, to me, though, is in a heap of trouble. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we'll kind of die. I'm sure we'll dive into that, you know, in a little bit. But uh, I got some pretty depressing stats as a Cowboys fan to share with you when we get to that point. Um, well, you know. if you wouldn't mind, I'd say what I, where I'd like to start, if that's okay with you. You want to talk about the fact that the Browns forced the Steelers six turnovers and still couldn't win a game? Look, the Browns ended their winless streak in the most Browns way possible by getting high. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's well said. I'm not going to go overly crazy with the turnovers because the weather towards the later parts of that game started to get really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, props to James Conner blatantly showing the NFL and, you know, those that are like, oh, just pay Le'Veon, just pay Le'Veon blatantly showing the, the world why the Steelers aren't that concerned with play, paying Le'Veon. I mean, I'm not saying James Conner is Le'Veon Bell. Uh, I want to make sure that's clear. But with the stats he put up, uh, let's be honest, it's kind of something you can work with because if Big Ben doesn't turn over the ball, that that's probably a blowout game, and a lot of it's contributed to how well Conner played. Um, but you want to talk about the most Browns, most Browns way possible to end a, lo- uh, a losing streak. Let's end it in a football game with a freaking tie. I mean, you can't get more Browns than that if you tried. Uh, great to see Josh Gordon out there getting the touchdown. Jarvis Landry putting up big numbers for them. Uh, t- Taylor showing why that, why they didn't choose to start the rookie Mayfield over him. Um, you know, the biggest thing that comes to me when I look at this Browns team, and we touched on this a couple weeks ago, I just wish Joe Thomas was there for this. I really do. I mean, all the years he went through, all the struggles, all the ups and downs, mainly downs. I mean, this team actually has potential and has a future to build onto. And a guy that maybe sacrificed more than anybody else in that organization is sacrificed. And he's not even there to at least enjoy the turnaround and, you know, help them kind of build towards that future. Uh, that's just uh, – that's what I think of more than anything else. And, look, Pittsburgh has some holes, but we know Pittsburgh. When it comes down to the AFC, we still think them and New England are your favorites. And I don't change on that opinion even after what Jacksonville did last year because when it comes down to the quarterbacks, I'm still taking Big Ben over Roethlisberger. So I just think that's one of those that one of those games where Say that again. Say that again, Dave. You like, still taking who over who? I'm still taking Pittsburgh and New England due to the quarterbacks because I don't trust right. I'll take Roethlisberger over him, even okay. with what happened last year. Uh but I, I just you know, the the Browns have some potential. They're definitely going to win at least one game this year. I still think they come in somewhere between four and six uh, wins for the year. But here's here's my thing. If you, if if you don't mind, I want to say this. Like I said before, you came on the air. Here's my thing with the Browns. That was probably the best game of football in at least a year and a half. You had the team that, like you said, is always considered one of the two best teams in the AFC. They had them on the ropes. That game was all theirs, and they couldn't close them out. Six turnovers. I know what you said about the bad weather, but even if you take away six, let's say four turnovers, we'll be fair here. Um, The kid Denzel Ward showed everyone why the Browns took him fourth overall. Uh, Garrett played well. Peppers played well. And all you could do was a tie. Stuff like that just makes me wonder if this team is really ready to win. And that worries me for their chances throughout this season. See, and I can see that, but with some of the new faces they brought in, specifically Jarvis Landry, um, you know, having Josh Gordon back for, you know, what's hopefully going to be a full season. 
um, Tyrod Taylor, like, you know, a rookie quarterback in Mayfield, like, you know, bringing in some of the guys they brought in. These are guys that have, you know, gone through hard seasons and still pulled out wins, you know, specifically Jarvis Landry. Um, and, and I just think that's something that, I mean, if you watch the hard knocks, I mean, I, di- I didn't watch the actual se- like season with mm-hmm. Cleveland speech Jarvis Landry gave. I mean, that that's something that I think will benefit this team. And I also think them pulling away with a tie, even though they may not be, you know, happy about it, I do think is going to help them build up some confidence as the season wears on. And we all know one thing, when you're the more confident team on the, on the field, talent really doesn't matter. That confidence really uh, can propel teams to different levels, even if they're the less talented team. So I, I think they know they're building something special. I think they feel like they ha- they're on track to do something special. And I'm not mean, I don't mean this year. I just mean, you know, as the years go by and the guys that are on that team right now want to lay that foundation for that something special. And I do truly believe that at least. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. I can hear that. Well, while we go through, I want to talk about something I brought up before you came on. I think two of the more surprising things on Sunday. You had Ryan Fitzpatrick really turning the clock back around and putting up four touchdowns. I think it was four passing touchdowns, and he ran for a touchdown. 21 for 28 in the air, 417 yards, and uh, Buccaneers whip on the New Orleans Saints 48 to 40. This game was 41 to 24 going into that fourth quarter. Steelers scored 16 points in the fourth quarter, so they made it somewhat close. But this game was a blowout almost from the jump. And you look, the, the first pass that Fitzpatrick, uh, the touchdown pass that he made to Deshaun Jackson, there's a hookup I never really – thought that I was going to see too often this season. And it's funny because before the season, Jameis Winston, he gets suspended, and the head coach says, well, it's something to the effect of it's not a guarantee that Winston gets his job back. Listen, we know who Ryan Fitzpatrick is. We know he can pull a game out like this every once in a while. I'm not ready to anoint him the starter over Jameis Winston. But if he could string a few of these games together – Excuse me. They'd be in worse shape than going with Fitzpatrick over Winston for the rest of the season, you know? Well, I mean, look, the bottom line is, and this is kind of similar, maybe definitely not identical, but it's, it's a similar thing to what you saw with Dallas two years ago. Romo was clear is clearly, you know, still to this day, I think Romo's clearly the better quarterback between him and Prescott. But when you have a team on the roll and, you know, momentum's riding high and the guys in the locker room are behind the guy behind center, you don't make a change. Mm. You, you, you ride it out and then, you know, yeah, if you lose one or two in a row, all right, yeah, give Winston back, back his job. But if Fitzpatrick keeps playing this way and keeps winning, you don't make a change. I, I do completely agree with you. We all know who Ryan Fitzpatrick is. But let's keep, on, keep in mind. He also stringed together a pretty damn good season for the Jets. I mean, yes, week 17, when it mattered the most, he laid a complete and utter egg and stopped them from making the playoffs. But at the 16 weeks before that, had a pretty damn good season. So, you know, you ride the wave, you let them build the momentum, you let them play well, and you kind of see where it goes. But I don't think if they're on a three, you know, if Winston, when Winston's what, suspended three games? I believe it's three, yes. Yeah. So they're three and zero, averaging forty points a game. I'm not benching Fitzpatrick for Winston, no freaking way. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And did you? I mean, I I, I said this before. I think we all thought Buffalo wasn't going to be very good this year. Did you think they'd be forty-seven to three bad? Uh, with them playing, uh, what's his name, a quarterback? Yeah, I, I thought being at least a you know thirty-point win. Yeah. I never would have thought – listen, 
you can say what you want about Buffalo being that bad. Nathan Peterman is not a legitimate NFL starting quarterback. The, the Ravens are not 47-3 to good. They, they're no. just not. No, they're, they're not as good at – look, the Ravens aren't as good as they had played and the Bills aren't as bad as they played. You know, we had this conversation last year after after the week one game the Cowboys had against the Giants. And – or no, I'm sorry, after the week two game against the Broncos when they got completely and utterly dominated. Mm-hmm. And we said the same exact thing. They're not as good as they looked against the Giants. They're also not as bad as they looked this week against the Broncos. So, you know, to me, it's kind of the same idea where Buffalo – Probably not as bad as they looked against Baltimore. Baltimore, probably not as good as they looked against Buffalo. Both teams are probably somewhere right in the middle. I mean, if you go back to our records predictions, and, you know, I do have them. I just got to grab them. But I'm pretty sure we have both of them at 500 or below. And I think that's kind of where you're going to see them fall. Yeah. I'm looking at mine right now. Hover around 500. You are correct on that. Yeah. I got Buffalo 7 and 9. You put 8 and 8. And Baltimore, where do I got them? I put them at 8 and 8, and you put them at 8 and 8. So. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I was looking at last year's stats. You're right. Yeah. So, like I said, better, worse, week one. Not going to kind of lose my stuff over that game. Um, but, I mean, Buffalo's got questions. Like, when are they going to put the rookie quarterback in? Uh, what's well, he, the deal with LeSean McCoy? He actually did go in this week. Oh, they did play him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they took Peterman out. It was either the first or second quarter they took him out. Allen didn't do good, but at that point, I think you knew he wasn't going to do good anyway. He'll probably be starting this week. Yeah, I don't know if I'd do that to the kid. I might let him have the year on the bench and redshirt him. But but here's the, here's the thing. If you still had A.J. McCarron, I would agree with you. You can't start Nathan Peterman at quarterback. I'm sorry. Allen can't be worse. He can't be worse. No, and I mean, unless you're the coaching staff and the GM looked at you and said, you know what, or, well, first the owner looks at the GM or you have a big meeting amongst everybody and just say, hey, we're going to accept, you know, 1-15, 0-16. We're going to take that top pick here and continue to build this, but. You got, you know, unless you got that guy saying all your jobs are safe, I promise here is it in writing, which will never happen. Yeah. Uh, but just saying, like, that's about the only way that you really rock with that that lack of talent at the quarterback position. Mm. Yeah, right on. But then again, Colin Kaepernick can't get a job, so, you know. It's very true. I'm not going to I'm not going to start that whole debate, but that's just mind-blowing to me. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I actually can't wear Nike shoes because the the shoes, the insides, my, my, always irritated my feet. So I haven't actually owned a pair of Nike since I was in fifth grade. It was the only pair of Nikes I ever had, and I couldn't do it again. Hey, see, and I don't – I actually don't wear Nikes just because they're too damn expensive. Yeah. Uh, I like my Adidas low top. That's basically what I rock out with, and then, you know, whatever dress shoes I have. But I just don't buy Nikes because they're just too damn pricey. That's really the only reason I don't buy them. I've had the same pair of Reeboks for about 15, 16 years. So, I'm with you there. I like yeah. Reeboks. I used to have the Allen Iversons. I used to like those things because they had the stuff at the bottom of the shoe that I liked for some reason. There you go. Not yeah. wrong with our AIs. They were good. Yep. No. All right, so let's talk about this Cowboy debacle here because we haven't, like, we talked a lot about Des Bryant not being there and Jason Witt not being there. And I got I got kind of killed last week for going off and missing Dan Bailey, even though they kind of proved me right on that one. But we didn't really talk about the fact that Travis Fredericks is out indefinitely with his uh, immunodeficiency virus that he has. And I, I don't remember the exact name for it, but it's, it's keep him out for at least – I'd say at least half the season, if not the whole season. And then Zach Martin's also hurting. And now all of a sudden, this, this Cowboys offensive line is, is human for the first time in about three or four years. Well, and that's the thing. I, Joe Looney is a serviceable backup. He's not as good as Travis Frederick. 
But when you look at the stats and how, the, how you break down and judge offensive linemen, he played a great game at center. The difference, though, isn't really in the st- stats and how you judge them. It's more of the stuff that doesn't show up on a stat sheet, a.k.a. the communication, helping the quarterback call out the blitzes, things along those lines. Those don't show up in any stat line, no matter how you do it or how you try to put it together. Those just don't show up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I actually, you know, there's several Cowboys beat writers I follow on Twitter. And one of them was doing breakdowns of the play and literally pointed out that the first play of the game that was a negative one yard run by Elliott should have been a minimum of about a 15 to 20 yard run and could have been all the way to the house because it would have been Zeke versus safety one on one. So the safety would have had to either take Zeke out and if he didn't, Zeke was gone. And it was all due to the fact that the communication didn't get passed down the line from Looney to Martin to uh, Collins, their right tackle, because of how the, the fact that it wasn't communicated the right way, Collins uh, crashed inside when they needed him to go outside. And just that simple difference between what Collins did is the difference between a negative one-yard run and a a run that could have honestly gone all the way to the house. So that goes back to the center and the quarterback, and Prescott, whole career, benefits from the other players that are around him. He's never, you know, I guess maybe one day he might be, but I I feel pretty confident saying – He's never going to be a Brady or a Rodgers, you know, this guy that literally can just take over a game by himself, Um, you know, and he relies on that help and they didn't get it set up and Zeke didn't, you know, gets hit in the backfield instead. Mm -hmm. So I do agree. They did look more human than we've ever seen them before. The rookie they have starting at left guard has a lot of room to grow as a player. Uh, specifically strength-wise, because he just gets balled over, and he's been getting balled over since the preseason started. Um, you know, so that, that's really kind of a question mark to me. I think if Frederick was ha- healthy, I wouldn't be surprised if you actually saw Looney starting at left guard over the rookie, but um, that's obviously not something they're going to do right now. Um, but, yeah, the offensive line looks human. The The – Offense as a whole look like a freaking joke. I don't think there's any other way to put it. And if I'm, as a Cowboys fan, you know, I know there are a lot of people that are out there, oh, it's just week one, you know, don't read too much into it. But I just wanted to give you those stats that I was telling you about before. Um, all right, so you got me, right, because I'm not inside the app right now. I want to make sure you can hear me. I can hear you. All right, so the Cowboys last – Four regular season games on offense. They've scored 20 points, 12 points, 6 points, and 8 points, with making it an average of 11.5 points per game. Prescott's passing yards per game, 212, 181, 179, 170, for an average of 185.5. Elliott's rushing yards per game. Uh, rushing touchdowns, I'm sorry. Rushing touchdowns per game. One, zero, zero, and the one on Sunday, making out for a .5 rushing touchdown per game average. Top wide receivers' yards per game. 47, 43, 50, and 73 this past Sunday for 53 and a quarter yards per game average and exactly one offensive touchdown scored in the last 10 quarters. That's horrible. So, for how badly I want to sit here and just say it's week one, don't overreact. That's our last four regular season games. And keep in mind, the week 17 game against Philly, it was basically our starters for the entire game versus their second and third string players. All right, before I get really depressed, let's um, – I, 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 I want to make sure we don't run out of time here. Okay, and that was just some horrible stats. It's just, this is going to be one long damn season. Um, let's, uh, let's go to our game picks. 
for week two here. Um, now, looking back on last week, I just want to make sure I got what you picked last week. So, Dave, last week you picked Philadelphia, Jacksonville, and Carolina, right? I think I picked Dallas to win, but I did pick Jacksonville and I did pick Philly. Okay. You could have said Carolina, and I probably would have gone along with it because that's what I had written down from you last week. But anyway, okay, so you're going to be honest. You picked Dallas. That means you and me both went 2-1 and one last week. Eric went 1-2 and two last week. So that's how we head into this week. So, so that's not on this week. How would you say? So that's why he's not on this week, because me and you did better at game picks, right? Apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It it is his anniversary, though, from what he told me. So congratulations to Eric. And apparently we're getting wedding invites soon, Dave. I know he asked me for uh, for my address last week. We're going to the wedding. Yeah, we got to save the dates coming. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be there, man. I'm going to be there. I'm happy it's March. So I will definitely be there. So it'll be I doesn't do it on a Sunday. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if you got things going on on a Sunday, but it's not football season, so we got that going for us. Uh, just weddings on the sun on a Sunday. I don't care what time of year it is. Just it, I just it. I hate it. I got work the next day. I, I want to enjoy the wedding. And instead, you got to go home early and get the bed so you can go work. Like, where's the fun in that? That is a fair but, point. Yeah, shout out to Eric. Congratulations on the anniversary. Definitely looking forward to the wedding. Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to Eric, yes. All right, so let's go to our game picks for this week. We're going to be picking the Giants taking on the Dallas Cowboys at, in Texas Stadium. We will find out whether we think Cleveland will get their first victory in a year and a half against the New Orleans Saints. And it should be a very good matchup, a very intriguing matchup after this past weekend. you got the Minnesota Vikings going into Green Bay to take on the Packers. So let's start with the Giants and Cowboys here. Uh, i got to be honest, uh, even before you ran down all those putrid stats, I thought the Giants were going to win this game. I think the the Cowboys' defense actually looked pretty good, if we're going to be honest. You take away Cam Newton running all over them. I thought DeMarcus Lawrence looked like he's going to be more than a one-year wonder. Sean Lee is always solid if he's on the field. You get a couple more decent plays from a couple more players. I think they have a a serviceable defense, to say the least. But um, I'm still going to go with the Giants in this one because their defense looks pretty good, too. So I'm going to go with the Giants. I have New Orleans over the Browns. And I'm going to say Aaron Rodgers plays this week. And I have the Packers over the Vikings. So who you got, Dave? So I'm with you at the Cowboys-Giants game. I mean, honestly, until the Cowboys offense shows me more than what we've seen from them, um, I I just – I can't trust them. And kind of similar to how the Giants were last year where, look, their defense was really good early in the year. But by the end of the year, they just gave up because the offense just – didn't support him anymore. So, you know, all those people that knocked the Gi- Giants' defense, it was just exhaustion and wear and tear and injuries. There, there was really nothing else to it. Yeah. Um, where I think, you know, the Giants offensively have the ability to do more. I trust Eli more than I trust Prescott. And honestly, my biggest hatred towards the Cowboys isn't even Prescott or the offensive line. It's it's Linehan and the coaching, and I just don't trust. I just don't trust them on the offensive side. I just don't. Hmm. So um, I, I'm I'm definitely I I hate it, but I think the Giants take the win in Dallas. Um, I think New Orleans gets the win against Cleveland. I just think what we saw from them this past week was more of a get off your high horse, young defense. Yeah, you guys had a great year last year, but the NFL is a what have you done for me lately league, not your past. That doesn't matter until five years after you retire and you get put up for the Hall of Fame voting. So, you know, I, I think that kind of gets them – you know, kind of knocks them back to reality, gives Sean Payton some coaching uh, pointer points. Um, and offensively, they're going to be able – I think they're going to be able to score more than Cleveland can, and that's how you win. So uh, I'm going to take New Orleans. 
Um, and then in the Minnesota Green Bay game, I actually am leaning towards. Uh, I'm going to take Minnesota, um, and that's because I actually think Rodgers doesn't play. I know he said that he's going to play, but he, that's him, you know, high off the energy of a Week One win at home. You know, I'm sure they shot him up at ha- you know during halftime before he came back out. So he woke up Tuesday mor- or Monday morning in a lot, a lot of freaking pain. So I, I think th- I think there's a-, a good chance he doesn't end up playing. And honestly, if I'm Green Bay, I'd rather be cautious with him than you know run the risk of losing him for the whole year. Um, so, and not to mention Minnesota defensively, they're the ones that knocked them out last year. Uh, their pass rush, they, you, so you can't. Get, there's no way he's not going to take hits, especially if he's on a bad leg. He's not going to be able to scramble uh, compared to what you're used to from him. So that's the only place I disagree with you, my friend. I'm taking Minnesota over Green Bay, but other than that, I got New Orleans over Cleveland and the Giants over Dallas. Yeah, if Rodgers don't play, I'd be screwed because I think the Vikings would win in that scenario too. But uh, in Rodgers, we trust, man. I'm going to go with Rodgers. Absolutely. Um, now, we got a few minutes left here. Let me ask you something because I don't watch tennis, and I'm sure you don't either. But so I got home Saturday from a long day at work. I was depressed that I passed out for about four or five hours. And I woke up, and on YouTube, they had the highlights from the U.S. Open finals. And I saw the whole episode with Serena Williams. Did you happen to see this, Dave? Yeah, it was kind of a mess. Yeah, and I, I wanted to talk about this real quick because it's, it's a very interesting thing. So. Again, I don't really watch tennis. I don't know a lot of the history. I don't know a lot of what goes on with other players. I don't know what goes on as far as the difference between the men's circuit and the women's circuit. I don't know any of that stuff. So in the beginning, you had the referee issued her a warning because the, the, her coach was giving her hand signals. She goes up to him and says, he wasn't coaching me. I know why you would think that. But I don't cheat. I'd rather lose than cheat. That whole thing was a very, very nice thing. She gets a nice round of applause from the crowd. Then later on in the match, she's getting dominated by this kid from Japan whose name escapes me at this point. But um, she breaks her racket in frustration, and she gets docked uh, a point. So her opponent goes up 15 to love. And... She starts yelling at the umpire, at the at the referee. I, I don't know if it's considered a referee. I think it's a line judge. And I thought it was a little harsh that he actually counted the warning as a warning. And the broken – first of all, I don't understand why you get docked the point or if it's considered a violation if you slam down a racket in frustration. That's terrible. It's not exactly like you hurt the racket's feelings or anything. It's an ironman object. The only one you hurt is yourself because you have to buy another racket now. But anyway, so she gets docked to 15 points. She starts berating me, even though it was a very polite berating, if we're going to be honest. She didn't curse. She called him a thief. She said, you owe me the point. You owe me an apology, all this. And then she gets docked again. So she's already down four to three. Then it becomes five to three, and we're basically at match point, and she loses it from there. She gets fined $17,000 for this. And then I find out this is not the first time she's had problems with the officiating at the U.S. Open before. She once told a line judge she was going to shove a ball down her throat. <laughs> and it's like, dude, she didn't do that to this. And I thought that line judge looked like the biggest pansy on the face of the planet while this whole thing was going on. And it's like I wanted to be 100% on her side. Then I started thinking about it. Then what well, I um, had all the tennis legends coming out for them. Martina Navratilova publishes an article in the New York Times, I think it was, saying just because the men do things like this doesn't mean you should lower yourself to that level. You should be better than that, which I thought was very well said. So what was your opinion on this whole thing, Dave? I mean, look. 
Bottom line is her professionalism wasn't great. Mm-hmm. 100% should have handled herself better. With that being said, I don't. I think she did get screwed out of being Doc the game, but she would have lost. Oh yeah. And yeah. you know, one of the things that's not really being mentioned, you know, when people talk about this story, is when they um, gave the girl the you know the trophy for winning the tournament and beating Serena. Um, when they, when they did that, the entire crowd started to boo. Mm-hmm. And Williams stepped up and told them to stop and raised the girl's hand up and, like, you know, showed her the recognition she deserved because she was the better player that day. And mm-hmm. Williams let the uh, emotion and stuff get to her. And she really kind of dropped the ball on that, and she knows that. But... I don't think she should have been docked the game. I think it would have been uh, better to, you know, I don't know. Like you said, I'm, I don't know enough t- about tennis to sit here and say, oh, well, they should have did this instead of what they did. Or, like, I don't know what the other options are. But I think they should have been able to at least finish the game the right way, you know. And, and I, like I said, I, I Williams could have handled, her, handled herself better. But when the story was all said and done, she did the right thing and told the fans to, you know, give the girl the credit she deserves. She, you know, I just, to me, it's one of those things where for how bad it could have been, it, it she saved it. Mm-hmm. You know, that girl deserved the credit that she got. She deserved to, you know, get that trophy. She was the better player that day. Williams knows it. She recognized it. and. You know, really, a, a very competitive competitive athlete lost their stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and there's really no other way to say it. But to me, it'd be like in an NBA game, instead of giving a player a tech, you know, you're 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 in automatically kicking them out of the game. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, she got the warning, but not for what she did, for what the guy thought the coach, uh, her coach, was doing. Like. She broke the racket. All right, yeah, that's a penalty. I get that. Like, you got to control your emotions as a professional athlete. It's part of the deal. But to dock her a game, I thought was too much. Yeah, I agree with that. And the coach actually admitted, yes, I was coaching, but every coach out here is doing that, which, okay. So apparently the, the line judges have to do a better job of enforcing that rule with everyone if they're not supposed to be doing things like that from the stands. Because apparently that coach felt like everyone was doing it, so why can't I? So, which, which I, it depends on how they enforce the rules. All right, so we got a little less than two minutes left. Well, bang, going back to Chicago. What is it? Is it Chicago West or Chicago East? The Timberwolves? Uh, West. Oh, okay, Chicago West. You think he's got anything left? I think he, more than anything, he's a serviceable backup and a guy that can help some of the younger talent on that team continue to develop. But outside of that, he's not competing for any six-man-of-the-year awards or comeback player of the year or any of that stuff. It's just I think, he, I think he's a serviceable backup that you know can help some of those young guys really learn the game of basketball because – he, he, he he's always been a good player, but, you know, he's never been a superstar. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. It's going to be interesting to see how he does. At the very least, it's another body for Tom Thibodeau to completely run into the ground. Hey, I'm on my Timberwolves, baby. Let's yeah. go. T- hey, I, I root for him, too. They, they're a good team. I, I hope that I, – I hope – they were able to make at least the semifinals this year. All right, man, we got less than a minute left. Dave Hastings, thank you very much for being with me tonight, my friend. Any last words? Always a pleasure, my friend, and until next week. All right, man. And that is going to do it for us here. I am your host, Mike Aglia. Laura, we get Eric Tressler back last week. Thank you all for listening. We will see you all next week.